today will be valuable to you uh, as we launch uh, and introduce you to strategies and ideas that are going to help you take your business to a completely different level this year. Uh, the title of the program is affectionately called 91 Leads in 19 Hours, The Keys to Large Event Success. Um, what this really comes down to is, is my first sales job when I was 12 or 13 years old was going out and doing credit card sign-ups and tele, uh, timeshare lead generation at at sporting events and trade shows and, and uh, expos and, and stuff like that around the country with my stepdad's company. We'd go out three, four weekends a month and, and go do these different trade shows around the country. So as I evolved and as my sales skills developed and grew over those early years, um, I started to learn how to do things differently to create a much better result when exhibiting or uh, presenting at these types of trade shows and expos. And as I got into the mortgage business and started looking at how to do lead generation, um, I started to apply a lot of those concepts to what I was doing to build my coaching practice and build a healthy group and flow of leads. Um, you know, one of the things that we often look at and some of the things that we have to think about is, you know, First of all, what does a trade show provide you? Let's say we're going to go to the local home builder showcase or the, the local lawn and garden spring event, uh, right? You know, and we're going to spend $500, $1,000, $1,500, uh, maybe even more to exhibit at that event. Like here in my little town of Jefferson City, Missouri, we do a, the Chamber of Commerce every year does their small business expo. And typically, you'll have 1,200 to 1,500 people attend that show in the two and a half days that it runs. You know, it runs from Friday at 4, basically, till Sunday at 6, uh, with hours left out for church and stuff like that. And, and so in that, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours that we have the opportunity to connect with the 1,500 people that might be walking through that expo hall in that very short period of time, we have to think about what is the purpose and goal of what we're really trying to accomplish at, at that event. And the, there's really three layers to it. Is it a list building exercise? Is it a marketing event? or is it a sales opportunity? And more often than not, we have a tendency to look at it from the wrong perspective. You know, over the, uh, over the, the almost two uh, decade and a half that we've been doing training and development and speaking and coaching and teaching people how to grow their businesses, a majority of mortgage and real estate professionals have a tendency to look at trade shows as if it's an opportunity to catch the next sale. Well, that may or may not necessarily be the most profitable way to take advantage of a large event. The only time that it really becomes a true sales event is if it's a longer event where you have more intimate interactions with smaller groups of people. That's when it typically becomes a sales event. If it's a multi-day event where you have the same group of people coming in and out of the expo hall, more of a training conference style of event, and if you're exhibiting at an event like that where the attendees are likely to be customers of yours, then you have a little bit more of a sales opportunity. But otherwise, you have to think about it as a little bit more of a marketing or list building activity or event. So one of the things you want to think about is it's really about generating leads and finding the best and the highest bandwidth of opportunity to how to do that. I mean, think about it from this perspective. Let's, let's use fishing as a comparison, right, or an example. You know, if I want to go catch a fish, I can go trolling around in whitewater fishing and, uh, and blue water fishing open water, and it can be a great way to kill an afternoon and enjoy the sun and the fun. And, and But the problem is if I hook a fish, there's a lot of things that can go wrong that keep the fish in the water instead of in the boat, right? And if I'm really looking about generating food or a meal for my family, is that the best way to fish? Maybe there's a different way of approaching the concept that, that helps us create a more consistent flow of food, for example, if we're wanting to feed a family. Like, for example, fishing with a net, right? You know, the likelihood is I'm going to catch a much bigger, uh, a much uh, more consistent volume of fish that I'll be able to then feed my family and maybe even my village. And if I scale that up, up on a massive basis to the size of a commercial operation, I can guarantee that I'll be able to draw in a much higher poundage of fish in the time frame that I have. And that's the kind of scalability that we create when we start thinking about large event. Like you go back to that Chamber of Commerce Expo I talked about here just a minute ago. Literally 12 to 1,500 people walk through that expo hall in 17, 18, 19 hours that one weekend uh, in this particular area. And you have such, so if you think about it, you know, do the math as far as how many people per hour are walking by that booth, uh, particularly if there's any other educational component to that event, 
um, you know, they tend to come in surges. So the reality is we have to think a little bit differently about how we're going to turn this into an opportunity that's going to allow us maximum capture. And those are the tools and strategies that I'm going to be introducing you to today in this program to equip you to the next trade show that comes up in your area, that next home builder showcase, the next home lawn and garden show, that next whatever event it is that makes sense for you as a mortgage or real estate professional to exhibit at. Um, like, for example, um, I had a client recently who did very, very well at a golf show, especially because a lot of the residential golf communities in his area were exhibiting at the show. It became a great networking opportunity for him as well. He also was offered the opportunity to present at one of these shows some basic topics of how to uh, you know, buy luxury homes um, and value considerations to be aware of when buying golf community, you know, golf course community properties and those kind of things. Well, he did a good 30 to 45 minute educational program which helped him build massive credibility. But even without that, these types of events can be huge ways to generate massive volume. So the things that we got to think about is what are the needs or the opportunities of the audience that's likely to attend? Uh, what is it that you do for them? What benefit do you provide? What value do you create for those family? And why should they spend the time to speak with you and hear your message? The secondly uh, is, you know, what are the tools of steady volume and lead generation growth? I mean, it really is a numbers game. You know, out of the 1,500 people that attended the last, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce Business Expo that we did. Roughly 300 or so of those families stopped by our booth and filled out our entry form. Out of the 300 or so folks who stopped by our booth and filled out our entry form, we identify 91 of those 300 people had some level of interest in maybe benefiting from a change or improvement to their housing or mortgage situation. So we literally, in the course of one weekend, generated 91 reasonably solid mortgage leads. That's why I call the event 91 loan leads in 19 hours. Because it's a, but it's a filtering process. How do we, out of the 1,500 people at the show, catch the maximum volume of people who visit our, who walk by our booth? And out of the hundreds of people who walk by our booth and turn in an entry form for our raffle drawing, which ones are the 90 that are actually worth talking to after the show? So that's the, the second key to an effective strategy to market at these big events is you've got to have an effective system to create consistent results. How to get their attention, how to offer some value worth their time to fill out your entry form, and then what to do after to create that follow-up and review and refinement process as you move from one event to the next. So the first thing we've got to talk about is let's talk about how to bring in the highest volume, the greatest number of people. Some of this has to do with even some things that may not seem that apparent. But let me ask you something. This is something I'd love you guys to chat in on and, and give me some feedback. I'm going to give you two examples of good versus bad. Okay, These two different booth pictures from a trade show, right? Uh, this was from a, a local home builder's trade show, right? People exhibiting and marketing products and services related to, to home refinement. Tell me which one, the, the one on your left or the one on your right, would you say is the better booth when it comes to maximum foot traffic? Go ahead and chime in, guys. All right, the, most of you are saying the one on the left. Obviously, yes. One, you'll notice they have all their display tables pushed to the back of the booth. Secondly, especially if the show will allow you to do it, if you can drop the side rail from the booth area, then you can get traffic from both aisles in and congregating around your booth. Now, they have their raffle entry form materials. If you notice, this is a little hard to see, but you notice they have a simple pad with an entry form and a very easy to use raffle thing right out in the corner of the booth that's about as close to the audience as you could possibly get. Here's another example, right? Which one, good or bad, left or right? Which one is the better booth? Notice this one didn't even have anybody in the booth. A big no-no when it comes to doing trade shows. Absolutely, guys, the one on the right is the one that we want to go with. Again, if you can get a corner booth, it drop the side rail, open up the booth, create space, have attractive items that they would want to see or participate with as you move forward. 
So a lot of this becomes just layout and design. Be prepared in advance. Think about the space that you're going to be in and how to uh, open it up as much as possible so you can get as many people in through your booth as, as possible. So the second thing is, what do you say to people? How do you actually bring them in to your booth? And, and like I said, this is literally just about communication strategies and systems of consistency. And when we talk about systems, we're talking about the key uh, to consistent actions is basically we're not talking about any kind of sort of complicated CRM or barcode scanner uh, approach or anything like that. It's just series of consistently repeated actions that we can do over and over and over again that work effectively well. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to introduce you to some conversation strategies or scripts that you can use at trade shows. Now, here's the problem. When I say the word script, how many of you look kind of like this guy, right? I use this on purpose a little bit because I wanted a, a moment of humor. But the reality of it is, is this is a gentleman by the name of Michael O'Shea from the 1968 version of Romeo and Juliet. The actor Michael O'Shea played the role of the vicar in Shakespeare in that Shakespearean play, Romeo and Juliet. Well, he won an Academy Award for the role. And the, the problem is, though, is how many of us go about the process of scripting in a sales environment uh, by focusing on the performance? Yet, do we have the natural talent and the practice time necessary to really, uh, you know, to perform at such a high level? I mean, this guy. I mean, think about how many thousands of hours of practice it took for him to really believe, for us to believe that he was that character, and what initial innate talent did he have that allowed him to perform that role so well, whether we have that or not. Versus, what if we just memorize a couple of key talking points? And instead of trying to be focused on memorizing and mastering the performance, where we're focused on the mechanics of the performance and not the conversation which, with the potential audience or the potential customer who might be walking by our booth, we want to break that down and we want to use a, an exercise to learn specific talking points that will help you be able to absorb these strategies much faster. So we call it the breakdown exercise. This is something we frequently do with our coaching and, and uh, clients and our uh, groups that we do workshops with and stuff like that. We do a lot of role-playing exercises related to this as well. But my goal here is that, and guys, if you apply this even live on the webinar, the next uh, conversation strategy I'm going to introduce you to, you can even use this right now to take away from today's webinar tools that you'll be able to use immediately that will help you start capturing a higher percentage of the clients you have the opportunity to talk to. So the first step is what am I really trying to get, what am I really trying to accomplish at this particular moment, at this particular point, at this particular event, right? The second thing is what are the key points or phrases that are going to create the highest probability of me achieving that goal? And then the third element is practical implementation, role playing it and using the script in a live environment as fast as possible. Of course, every time we try something, whether we're doing it in a role play, and even if you don't have a role playing partner or a colleague that you're comfortable doing this with, you can even do this with a tape recording device, right? One of those little voice recorder machines or whatever, something like that. Record yourself, play it back, listen to how you went through that conversation outline, and ask the question, what went well? In other words, what do I want? want to make sure it gets repeated, what do I want to reinforce as a new habit, where can I improve, and what will I do differently next time. By applying this strategy, then when we start thinking about how we want to draw people into the booth, one of the things we want to be able to think about is what are the triggers, the what's in it for them is the number one thing that we want to communicate that's going to create the highest probability of response, right? Because essentially what we're asking them to do is share personal information and spend a little bit of a time to evaluate and let us know how or when or what we could do to help them. So depending on the type of event, now for example, uh, Maximum Acceleration, we do a lot of trade shows in, uh, uh, around the country and conferences that happen every year. One of the things I always exhibit with is we, we raffle off a free month of coaching. Now, part of the reason we do that is because, one, that by itself, the, the, the thing we're giving away is a bit of a filtering device to begin with. Anybody who's not really interested in coaching isn't going to stop and give us the time of day. 
fine, I'm okay with that. Secondly, as we raffle off, we're offering them the opportunity to win something of value to them. Now, the way I'm positioning that is as they're walking by the booth, I'm asking them, hey, have you signed up to win the free coaching yet? And as I'm doing it, I'm literally handing them an entry form because uh, physiologically and psychosomatically, they're going to take whatever I'm offering. Our natural response is when somebody goes to hand us something, we tend to take it from them, right? It's a predetermined, predisposed, natural response. So likely it is they're going to take it and look at it. Now, the next thing I'm typically going to say, especially because more often than not, they're going to have this kind of you know, curious, what is this all about type of look on their face. So I'm going to usually follow that up with something that identifies what we're really offering them. Now, if I'm a mortgage professional or a real estate professional exhibiting at like the Chamber of Commerce Expo, uh, uh, I may do something like a, a Weber barbecue grill. It was one of my favorites to do at the, the Chamber of Commerce Business Expo. I mean, one, it's something to catch the entry forms in every way, and two, most people really like them. Um, it's just kind of neat and fun and, and something to do. So, you know, the, the, the conversation strategy would be, have you signed up to win the free barbecue yet? And if they started to kind of look at it and going, well, what is this? Then my response is going to be a little bit along the lines of, well, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, we are a mortgage advisory firm. We help people uh, with achieving their housing and, and financial development goals through managing their mortgage. However, this form helps us to identify any areas of opportunity, and we won't pester you if there isn't an opportunity for us to be of some value to you. So it'll save us both a little bit of time. Is that okay? Right? So again, I'm still communicating at that what's in it for them level. I'm sharing with them who needs us. So when you really begin to think about what are those needs and, and what is the value you really create to consumers, the first question you got to think about is what level, what service do you really provide? I mean, as a mortgage or real estate professional, we are helping families make decisions about what is often the most important financial decision of their lives. So as a result, we create a very high probability that, uh, you know, that, that we're going to be an asset and a resource to them and helping them achieve their financial development goals or their housing improvement goals through what we do. So when you start to think about who is the audience that I want to attract as a mortgage or real estate professional, there's a couple of things I need to be thinking about. One is that knowing that right now housing affordability is at an incredible high. I mean, we are literally dealing with as far as how much house for the payment monthly you get, some of the highest levels of affordability in literally the last 100, 150 years. I mean, the last time we had this much buying power as American consumers was in the late 40s and early 50s in the post-World War II era. So, you know, when we start thinking about Unfortunately, however, there's a whole lot of families out there that are just kind of oblivious to that, right? The family who works hard, pays their bills on time, and they're still renting the same place they've been living in the last couple of years. The family that has outgrown a home uh, that they bought six, seven, eight years ago in the 06 or 07 time frame, and, and now they've had an additional child, or they've had their parents have to move in with them, or whatever. And, and they're literally busting at the seams in, the, in a home that no longer meets the needs of that family. So once I've identified who it is that I want to provide or create an opportunity to provide value and service to, I can then help communicate with them. Because look guys, when it comes to finding business, it really is about an equal exchange of value. I mean, one of the things that, that I try and demystify is this whole concept of sales, right? We don't want to be known as salesy, right, or salespeople. There's a there's a, a significant negative connotation to sales. But if you go back and look at what is the real definition of sales, it's about an exchange of value between two willing and able parties. The key there being exchange of value. So in a uh, conversation at a trade show, that is a sale they are exchanging a couple minutes of their time with some expectation of value they will receive from me. So if I'm helping them evaluate 
efficiently whether I do or do not have an opportunity to serve them and provide something that would be valuable to their, their family up to and including even just at the first level basic information that would help them decide whether they do or do not want to pursue making a change or improvement to their living situation, am I or am I not providing value? Now, another example of this, and by the way, what you're actually seeing is a sample of the entry forms that we, uh, that we work with our coaching clients and that I use personally as an originator for many years, is just a little bit of a filtering, right? In, in a matter of 45 seconds, 45 to 60 seconds, they can very quickly go through and identify, are they buying or selling a home in the next couple of months? I mean, the practical reality is, you know, narcissists have been telling us for, for you know, seven, eight decades, they've been tracking the average ownership time frames of, of the American homeowner, right? It's always ranged somewhere between five and seven years, which means one-fifth to one-seventh of the population is likely to move in the next 12 months. And because people don't decide they want to buy a new house today and they're in a contract tomorrow, typically it's a six, 12 month or even longer thought process. So that means that out of that 1,500 people that are walking through that trade show, likely one-fifth to one-seventh of them are already at some level of thinking about doing something different with their home. So our job becomes trying to filter out and identify efficiently which are the one or two out of 10 or you know, uh, 12 to uh, 20 out of 100 or 120 to uh, 200 out of 1,500 that are thinking about doing something different with their housing situation. And that's how this scalability can work explosively uh, when you come to the kind of numbers that you want to try and generate. So the first step is really creating that efficient filtering. And by the way, usually there's one particular question on this raffle entry form that you want to focus on, which is basically their indication that they would like you to follow up. Like, for example, are you interested in receiving a no-cost, no-obligation strategic financial review that includes a complementary credit protection analysis? Right Now, that's a little bit wordy. Over the years, we've actually fine-tuned and reduced the overcomplication of that language, we've, and we've worked to simplify what we're really offering. Uh, in today's market and environment, if I were going to be doing any trade shows this spring, personally, as an originator, I would be going out and asking, are you interested in the cost and obligation home opportunity evaluation? Right home opportunity focusing on either refinance or purchase uh, somewhat unilaterally. Uh, that's if I'm doing a consumer-oriented trade show. Who is the audience I'm likely to meet at that event? So as you're thinking about and planning for these events, that's one of the key things you want to identify is who is the audience. You know, is it the local home builder show? Well, the folks attending are likely people who have some interest in building a home. Otherwise, they wouldn't be at a home builder show, right? Um, you know, if I'm exhibiting at a golf show, uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, these people are, are people who have a, an interest in and, and and enjoy playing golf. Well, is there a possibility that folks who like playing golf might want to eventually buy a home on a golf course? You know, it's those kind of things. So, so as I tailor and adjust specific to the event, I want to tailor and adjust my entry form to try and speak their language a little bit more. The second thing that I can do is, OK, what about trade shows that are industry-based? Like, for example, many of our coaching clients, uh, for example, one of my clients up in the Connecticut area, in a little town called Danbury, Connecticut, in western Connecticut, a gentleman by the name of Ian, uh, every couple of months does his local Board of Realtors CE Day event. And in the course of that, one day where agents are um, going in and out of their, their CE classes, uh, you know, a seven or eight hour a day, they may have three or 400 realtors walking through their little event hall they set up between the classrooms, right? So we work to create an entry form that was specific to the needs of the realtors that he's promoting to at that event, you know, and frequently, uh, he hosts a business building mastermind event. It's a one-day event that we work together to help him structure and organize where he brings a group of realtors together and has them exchange ideas and talk about business building strategies and practices and, 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 and that kind of stuff, right? Um, well, 
in the last event he did, I think they had somewhere around 250 agents attend the day's events, at least one or two of the classes. They generated somewhere around 120 completed entry forms and somewhere around 40 agents indicated that they would like to talk to Ian about doing something deeper uh, in an ongoing business partnership style relationship. So as a result of that one day event, uh, Ian was able to accomplish quite a bit in the way of uh, fostering new partnerships with business development partners, particularly realtors in this case. So when we start thinking about deepening those relationships and, and going beyond what happens in the immediate follow-up, that's where we start probing and using more of a consultative sales process to really understand how we can transform that relationship. Now, one of the key things about that, though, is, is really being prepared to efficiently communicate what we're doing. Now, one of the things that will often happen is I hand that entry form to somebody, they're going to fill it out, and then they're going to hand it back to me, and they're going to ask me one question. Well, what's this all about? What is this home opportunity evaluation? What do you mean by a building, business building mastermind event? Well, here at XYZ Mortgage, we do things a little differently than most folks because over time we've realized that we want to be way more to you. Uh, and let me use the Realtor example. You know, Mr. Agent, at the end of the day, I don't want to just be the gentleman who gets your deals done. I want to be the guy who helps you get a lot more deals. Over time where I can become the asset and resource that's going to help you do substantially more business. Essentially what we're calling down to is, is branding, right? You know, what's more valuable, a dog? or an English Conqueror Spaniel, right? When you think about what you'd invest or spend more on, branding has a lot to do with it, right? You know, why is it you could buy basically the same pair of jeans at Walmart that you'd buy at Nordstrom's, but you're gonna pay 100 times more for the Nordstrom jeans? Are they really that much better? Who knows? Well, there is some credibility to that, and there is some, there is some value we can create above and beyond. But what we want to try and do is position ourselves effectively and communicate efficiently what it is we're really trying to do. And this is where we talk about hub statements. Okay, uh, Some of you may have heard these referred to as elevator pitches or uh, value propositions. Right? It's just a very easy, concise explanation to the what do you do or what is this all about question that we so often get when we meet new people for the very first time. Well, I help professionals define and implement strategies to accelerate their professional and company growth through our unique business acceleration program. Now, that's one I used to use frequently uh, when marketing our coaching company. Um, but what it really comes down to is what are the components of that statement, right? Who do we help, right? We help professionals, mortgage and real estate professionals, define and implement strategies, right? That's the action that we help them take that are designed to do what? What is the key benefit I'm hoping to help them achieve to accelerate their professional or company growth, right? And then we'll name it or label it because something that has a title typically carries a little more authority. We've taken the time to structure or systemize something if we're promoting it as a brand. So when you start thinking about creating your hub statement, and this might be one of those exercises that you would want to get the recording. By the way, for those of you who have been chatting in questions about will this be recorded and will we have access to it later, yes, uh, this is being recorded. There will be some post-production work our team will need to do, but usually by the end of the week we'll have a copy of this out to everybody who read registered, and you can even come back and use this material, this slide, and this uh, exercise uh, here at about uh, 35 minutes into the recording to be able to help you uh, with, with actually being prepared for your next event. So who do you help? Well, if it's a realtor show, I help realtors, right? What do I help them do? Substantially grow their business, right? By implementing, uh, by being an asset and resource to them that helps them do substantially more business through our partner development program, right? Now, you may want to skinny that down or you may want to make it a little more social, especially if it's more of a networking reception type event and a little bit less of a formal trade show environment. Uh, you know, hey, I help people get from where they are to where they want to be faster, right? It's 
just a very simple, very concise way of communicating what I seek to provide. And it really works best when we start with that service-oriented mindset approach first, right? From there, then we're able to move into a little bit more of a consultative conversation. But at the end of the day, it's, it's also a way of differentiating ourselves and elevating our value and credibility. Uh, again, go back to that realtor standpoint conversation, right? At the end of the day, on the mortgage side of things, we have a tendency to be kind of commoditized by realtors. We're only as good as our last deal. Uh, our value to them has a lot more to do with our ability to communicate effectively, give accurate and timely pre-approvals, and close deals on time, whether the expectation is realistic or not. And unfortunately, if that's what we're competing on, if we go out and promote ourselves to agents as being really good from a transactional level, and then something Thing else happens that wasn't even our fault that that flips the deal sideways we get blamed for it and the reality is in in today's world in a post Dodd Frank uh, you know post 2008 recession origination environment most of our competition are fairly competent from a transactional level right I mean the guys who can't get deals done aren't in the business anymore more so the practical reality is a lot of the times um, you know even if we are you know and and not only that there's this whole thing about promoting ourselves based on you know good service well the problem is every agent has heard that a hundred times and been lied to before by some bozo loan officer who messed up a deal somewhere along the way so do we really raise our credibility or in fact lower it if we're promoting the same thing everybody else does. Either way, we're really not differentiating ourselves. We're not raising the benefit we seek to provide, right? So how do we separate ourselves? How do we differentiate ourselves as mortgage and real estate professionals? Well, one of the key concepts and ideas that I like to talk about, and many of you in the audience have heard this before, so I'm going to kind of give you the short version of this. Basically what it comes down to is are we a vendor or are we an advisor, right? Are we somebody who's sharing with them information and concepts they may not be thinking about that have a longer-term impact and therefore much more significant value than our transactional ability on any one deal? So that's where we start getting into these concepts of being service-driven and oriented on focusing on sharing ideas and concepts that we don't know what we don't know. And our consumers often get stuck in the busyness of life, not necessarily realizing that there may be a bigger opportunity for them just beyond their visibility. So when it really comes down to it is do we care enough to take the time and energy to get them thinking about what opportunity might be just beyond the horizon for them? And if we care enough to, to slow down and take the time to share our thoughts, ideas, and concerns with them about what they might be missing out on, are we or are we not creating a substantially higher level of value? Again, when you go back to that realtor example, how do we become an asset or a resource that helps them do substantially more business in the coming weeks, months, and years, as opposed to just being the vendor capable of closing one deal and constantly judged by the one deal, right? Now, a lot of this could be maybe we do some partnership or collaboration with folks like realtors uh, or home builders or attorneys or financial advisors that we could team up with, particularly if we are really taking a more comprehensive look at how a mortgage plays into a customer's ability to achieve all their other financial goals, then likely we'll have an opportunity to create more value. And if we can leverage and partner with those agents to market at events and shows, uh, then, then we have the opportunity to be a much more significant asset and resource to them. You know, it goes back to the old concept of leverage of how do we move a lot more with a lot less effort and create better results. Well, like for example, let me give you another example of this, okay? How many people go to trade shows and, and when, you know, one of the things you always expect to get at trade shows is giveaways, right? You know, if I went back to some of the earlier slides of the booth, the little squeeze balls and the little trinkets and the, the breath mints and the notepads and, and stuff like that. Well, if I'm going to give away something at an event, what should I give away that has maybe potential for lasting value and impact, right? 
Like for example, can I give a drink koozie uh, as opposed to, to a water bottle, right? Water bottle gets drank once and thrown in the trash. Drink koozie is going to stay with people and get used over a much more frequent time frame, right? Another one would be, for example, like chip flips, right? Something that not only does it get used frequently, it also stays in the most popular room in the house, the kitchen, right? They're still relatively inexpensive. Yeah, they may not be the highest quality and they may break over time, but at least I might get a couple of months visibility out of that chip flip that I won't get out of the package of breath mints, right? Uh, another one would be like one of my favorite things I ever got from attending a trade show uh, was a one of those jar openers, right? I went to a, an event, and I don't even remember where I went to the event, but a title company was handing out those little can openers, the little rubber grippy things. That thing sat in my kitchen drawer for a decade, and only when one of my kids sliced it apart with a kitchen knife did I throw it away. And even then I was trying to use it for a couple of months after the fact. So if we're going to spend the money to give something away, why don't we give away something that has lasting value and visibility that will keep us top of mind uh, a much longer time frame, right? That would be one way, for example, that we could partner with realtors at the local home and garden show or the, the local golf show or the local boat sport and travel show to pass out information and for us as a co-branded team that would allow us as a team to have a lot more visibility long term. And then as we start thinking about following up from the lead sheets we collect at the event, we identify the folks who are actually reasonably serious about doing something different with their home, then when we make our follow-up plan and we do a little divide and conquer with the agent of, you know, which ones am I going to call, which ones are you going to call type of discussion, then we create better activity and follow through because at the end of the day we want to be able to efficiently comb through the leads and capture them as they're warm. You know, when they are the freshest and what is when they're e the easiest to follow through on. So what do you do with the leads that you gather? Does it make sense to maybe block out some time ahead of an event that you secure or protect after the event to do some follow-up? Like, for example, uh, with the mortgage company that I worked for and held my license with in 2010 and 11, um, you know, we booked out Tuesday and Thursday nights for the next two weeks after the trade show, that local Chamber of Commerce event. We booked out from 4 to 9 o'clock at night where we were going to be doing lead follow-up calls. And between myself and the other three originators with that company, we sorted out the leads and prioritized and but, you know, as we were working the event, uh, we would just make little notations. If if you know Brandon had happened to make a connection with one of the leads, he would jot down his name in the corner of the entry form so that we knew which ones were kind of Brandon's and which ones were mine, for example. Um, in addition to that, we had that time blocked out in advance that we were going to use to make those follow-up calls so that we could create the highest probability of capture. And the other thing that that became an extremely valuable resource is it became the accountability and follow through for the agents. Because how many times is it that, that you know, we, we might be tempted to just fall off the wagon or, or drop the ball on following through with those leads? So the couple of agents and the couple of insurance um, real, real estate agents and the couple of insurance agents who did that show with us and were actually were helping us work the booth at that event, we committed them and asked for their agreement and promised that they were going to attend that follow-up event. By doing that, we became the accountability resource that encouraged them. You know, we all, it goes back to that running buddy example, right? I've shared many, many times. I mean, the, the you know, New Year's resolution, for example. Let's say I want to lose some weight and I start jogging, right? If I start jogging by myself, if it's four or five days in, I'm worn out and it's a nasty weather day, what's the probability I just hit the snooze button and never go jogging again? But how different would that be if I had a running buddy who had made a commitment and promise to? It's so hard to break the promises we make to somebody we trust and respect compared to the promises we make to ourselves. So yet again, that's another way that we can be the asset and resource that helps one of our business partners, like a realtor, go from doing one or two deals a month this year to 
two to four deals a month by the end of this year so that we can help them in effect double their business in the next 12 months by leveraging these kinds of strategies and, and approaches for how to work together as a team to find more families that could benefit for a from a change or improvement in their housing situation, right? So how will you know and keep track of it all? One of the things you might also want to do is organize this. Put it all into a spreadsheet. In fact, if, you're, if you happen to be working with a show organizer who's a great person, like one of the folks that I happen to notice is on the webinar today, uh, and they're, they're gracious enough to give you a copy of the registration list, um, uh, you know, copy and cut and paste the ones that you got entry forms on and, and, and pull them to the side out of that spreadsheet into a target list, right? Um, and one of the things I like to add to that target list is the stuff, uh, you know, the responses to the most important filtering questions, so it's all organized into something that's more effective to update and easier to share more portable in that respect. It also allows for if I'm working with a team of multiple loan officers or I've got a team of myself, a realtor, uh, an insurance uh, agent, and we're all working together on the project, then we can do a little divide and conquer and we update this and put it on like a Google Drive or a, or a, a, a Dropbox folder that updates real time and keeps it effective. I guess what we're really talking about is, is just have a plan, and create an action and a commitment between the group that you're working the event with to hold each other accountable because that's going to create a much higher probability of success. Uh, so here's some things to think about when you do your next trade show. All right. One, keep the booth open. Two, set the back at the table. And by the way, this Tips for Success is a follow-up tool that we're going to attach to today's session uh, and, and to the email that will go out after today's webinar. Uh, I guess the last thing I want to do, and, and I'm going to jump into uh, some Q&A here, guys. So if you want to go ahead and start posting some of those questions in the Q&A for me, um, you know, really what it comes down to, and I guess this is a, a little bit of a um, side conversation to uh, the, the focus of today's webinar, but what are the things that we can really do to drive more business? You know, when we really start thinking about how to be a true asset and resource to those realtors in your community, what are the, the key things that you could do? Well, a couple of the things we've identified over the years that would really help significantly improve their batting average and their lead flow and volume would be things like these conversations right here. One is, and the most important element of this, is being an asset and resource committed to mining for those opportunities. I mean, you know, every customer we work with knows a group of folks that they're close to. Sociologists have been telling us for decades that the average American has a core group of 30 to 40 people that they have a close interpersonal relationship with. It's their circle of influence, right? We also know based on the NAR statistics that one-fifth to one-seventh of that circle of influence is at some stage of thinking about improving or changing their housing situation. So one of the key elements that we could do is talk to every customer we have about who they know that might be in a position or experiencing a life event that would put them in a position to benefit from a change or improvement to their housing and living situation, which is another talking point that you could use when doing one of these large-scale events, particularly if it's a consumer-oriented event close to or focused on something related to housing. Those things being key ways of significantly improving your performance and your results at these types of events. So let me do this, guys. Go ahead and post some of the questions in the Q&A, um, and we'll, uh, we'll get started here with following up on some of the questions here in, in just a minute. All right, one of the questions that was posted a little earlier in the program was, can you guys get access to these materials? Absolutely. Um, like I said, uh, within usually within 48 hours or so of the close of the webinar today, uh, we are going to be um, uh, creating a follow-up email to everybody who registered. That follow-up email will have uh, a copy of the PowerPoint, um, the additional tips for trade show success, the uh, additional um, and some of the additional tools and resources along with the link to the video recording of today's program. Uh, the second thing that uh, uh, that was asked here is is you know what would be the next step to look for. Um, all right, so what types of trade shows make sense? Okay, um, well 
the, the, uh, really anything that is consumer oriented in nature. Now, the, the more obscure the show, the less likely to be able to pull out a significant benefit as a mortgage or real estate professional. But the more fun and focused that you are on, um, on the, the events that are specific to where you might likely meet a customer, and that's why I say stuff like the, 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 builders, the home builders showcase. That's a great one because, you know, everybody who goes to that show is somebody who's thinking about building a house or changing or improving the home they're in, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, someone just popped in the question about will the will the webinar recording be available? Yeah, we, by the end of the week, we'll be getting out a follow-up email that will have a link to the recording, the PowerPoint, uh, and some of the other tools I've shown you guys today uh, as far as getting access to this material. Okay. All right. So one of the other questions that was asked here is, is okay, what is maximum acceleration? What do we do? I don't want to go too much in that, into that right now, but for the benefit of those who are already thinking, you know, what is this all about? Well, maximum acceleration, we do a couple of different things. Uh, we have three different levels of service between virtual coaching, home studies type programs, group or on-site coaching, and one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal coaching. Really what it comes down to is if you're thinking about wanting to get some help or support externally to help you grow your business faster, one of the best ways we've found to help people understand the true value of coaching or what we offer here at Maximum Acceleration is just to experience it. So if you're interested, we offer a no cost, no obligation strategy session and you'll get a little of feedback and information on overcoming one of your bigger growth challenges and along the way we'll talk a little about when and if coaching would make some sense to you. If you'd like to participate in that, uh, just feel free to go ahead and post in the Q&A now. Uh, do me a favor, give us the best phone number or email address. We only have a limited number of these sessions available each week, so they're kind of scheduled on a first come, first serve basis. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, go to the uh, strategy, mxlcoach.com slash strategy, and you can register for one of these no-cost and obligation sessions um, if you don't want to go ahead and post that here in the deal. Um, all right, uh, next question. Um, you know, the things that somebody asked about um, was the how do we drive purchase business? What is the value of time conversation? Um, this is one that talks a little bit about the filtering process to an agent. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit mundane sometimes, but really what a lot of it is is, is there's a lot of customers out there in, in the market that are totally focused on buying the house. Um, they tend to forget that there's a couple of steps before being ready to buy a house, especially in tight markets with limited inventory where buyers are likely to be competing against multiple other potential buyers presenting offers at the same time. So part of that value of time, and most agents know inherently that they shouldn't be working with buyers who aren't already pre-qualified. However, what most agents don't realize is how complex of a process that can sometimes be and the fact that not all pre-approvals are created equal, right? Um, you know, the, the reality um, of the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is there's still several loan officers out there across the country that do sort of what I call the three-question over the phone prequel. Hey, how's your income? How's your credit? Where, where are you getting your down payment from? Okay, sounds good. Great. Call me when you got a contract, right? Well, the problem with that is that buyer leaves that call feeling like they've been pre-approved, right? So they go talk to an agent. The agent goes and shows them dozens of properties. They get under contract, and lo and behold, they can't qualify for a loan. Not a real fun situation to be in. So that's why we talk to them about letting us validate. You know, out of every 10 or so people we talk to, maybe one or two are in the really ready to go right now bucket. There's another probably three or four out of 10 that are in the maybe within six months if they do a couple of things, like uh, paying off some debt so the ratios get back in line or, or saving up a little extra for down payment, that kind of stuff. Great, right? You know, it's those types of follow-ups that we talk about becoming that filtering mechanism for them. And a lot of that goes back to some of that numbers game filtering things that I talked about towards the beginning of the webinar. And, and that's what we also want to make sure we're proactive in communicating with the agents who say, look, you know, I don't want you to be spending time showing a property to anybody who's not 100% ready to be competitive at time of offer, which means I need to work them through the multiple-day process 
process of gathering all their infor documentation, uh, evaluating whether the documentation does in fact prove what they need to qualify for, and then once I get them to that stage, then I can help you with capturing and converting. By the way, along the way, I'm going to give you a very strong value-based endorsement of why they should work with you, Mr. Agent, versus the other 500 agents in the market that they could likely pick from. And, and it's by doing that sort of leveraged partnership that we create better results. All right, guys. Well, we're coming up on the top of the hour uh, here very quickly. And I'll, I'll hang out for a few minutes after the hour for anybody else who wants to stick around and pick my brain a little bit more. There's one last thing I'd like you all to do. You know, back in 1993, there was a research study done by Brigham Young University. And it talked about what does it really take to convert ideas into action. And, and you guys can read the information on the screen for yourselves. But basically, they found out if you do four very specific things, you have a 95% chance of implementing. So what we always do on these webinars uh, is, is I want to encourage you to take the time that you've already invested in attending today's webinar and do something with it. Put it into action, right? I mean, you know, the, the, there's this myth out there that knowledge is power. Well, the reality is knowledge is only powerful when it's acted upon. So one of the things that you want to do, and, and, and I apologize to the gentleman who just posted, if I could put up the buckets, I'll put them back up in just a minute. Let me finish the thought here, and then I'll go back to that in just a second, okay? But long story short, guys, you've already invested 55 minutes of your time today in learning something that's going to help you grow your business. So let's do something with it, right? So what was the first most valuable thing you want to implement? What was the one idea that caught your attention that you want to start using daily from this point forward? Take that one thing. You can always go back to the recording later and pick up the rest, right? Secondly is create an action plan. What are the steps you need to take to make that a part of your business? You know, if you want to do a home and garden show and be prepared to present well at the next home and garden show that comes up, well, you need to identify the show. You need to create a team that's going to work with. You need to reserve a booth space. You need to prepare your entry form. You need to decide what you're going to give away for your raffle drawing. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of steps to preparation, right? So jot down what those steps are. Write it down. Create that action plan. Set some milestones and target dates for implementing. This is step three in the four-step Brigham Young process, right? Put target deadlines on those actions. By when do you want to have the show selected? By when do you need to have your registration in and paid? By when do you need to have your entry forms prepared and off to the printer? Uh, that kind of stuff. Right? So set logical target dates for completing those actions in a time frame that makes sense based on the project you're wanting to implement here. And then the fourth thing is just decide who's going to be that accountability partner. And like I talked about with the running buddy example, if you do these four things, share that action plan with them, get them to ask them to hold you accountable to what you're trying to do uh, in following through on making the most out of that next trade show that you want to exhibit at. Um, you'll have a much, much better chance of actually creating the results that are going to turn into loan and lead and flow volume. Uh, you know, like I said, if you, if you need help finding an accountability partner or if you, uh, if you don't have one or can't identify one, we'd be happy to, to provide that service to you. It is one of the things we do at Maximum Acceleration is that one-on-one -on -one accountability and coaching. If you are interested in taking advantage of one of those no-cost, no-obligation strategy sessions, again, feel free to just go ahead and post the best phone number and email for our team to get a hold of you here in the, the Q&A section of the platform directly. Uh, otherwise, uh, go to that mxlcoach.com slash strategy website and you can register for for it. All right, uh, I'm going to jump back just a little bit, um, and, and somebody wanted to uh, see the four bucket slide. Uh, by the way, this comes courtesy of one of my uh, one of my best friends and, and favorite coaching members, a gentleman by the name of Randall Brower from the uh, Memphis, Tennessee metro area. He put this slide together for us and gave me permission to use this a couple of years back. Uh, I thought it was kind of uh, kind of funny. Um, yeah, that fourth rusty bucket is the one that, you know, the folks that just have way too many bad financial habits and are way too far out from qualifying, uh, if ever, right? <laughs> That's the fun one. Those are the ones that, that realtors always tend to throw at us first, don't they? Anyway, uh, so uh, guys, if you do have any additional questions, feel free to go ahead and post them into the webinar platform right now. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to stick around for just a few more minutes. Uh, as we're wrapping up and cleaning up some of the stuff in the background. Otherwise, um, you guys are free to go, and we look forward to seeing you on the next installment of the Maximum Performance Webinar. Uh, all right, did you guys get what you needed off the rest of your bucket slide? Perfect.
All right, guys. Other questions that you'd like me to address? Other comments or suggestions that you'd like? By the way, um, feel free to if you if you don't mind. Oh, excuse me a sec. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I got a little frog in my throat. Um, any topics that you guys would like to get some feedback on or some guidance or information on, feel free to post that in the Q&A as well. Uh, we're constantly looking for uh, new content and, and areas that you guys want some help or support with. So let us know what you want some help with. What are the struggles or challenges you're experiencing in your business right now? Uh, we'd love to, to get some thoughts on and some feedback on what future programming that you'd like to get some information about here on the webinar series. All right. Well, perfect, guys. Thank you. Thanks again for uh, um, you know uh, for investing your time in today's program. I want to applaud you all for being the the few who take the initiative to work on perfecting and refining your skills and craft. Um, you know, hopefully today's event has, has created some value for you. Uh, and if there's anything my team or I can do to help further that and and to take that to the next level for you, helping you accelerate your performance, uh, that is our only goal here at Maximum Acceleration: is getting you from where you are to where you want to go as fast as humanly possible. Uh, with that being said. Uh, uh, I'm going to hop off the webcam and uh, and off the uh, comms for the time being, and uh, and uh, we will leave the platform open for just a few more minutes if you want to post in any additional questions you think of, uh, or again one more time if you'd like to go ahead and take advantage of one of those strategy sessions, feel free to go ahead and and, and post that here now. All right. Otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing y'all next week. Mm -hmm.